Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the University of Arizona. The year 2022 marked the 350th death anniversary of the 17th century Zen master, Yinwang Longchi, Ingen Ryuki in Japanese. Today's event is one of a series of commemorative events which began on May 3rd, 2022. These events present and explore the extraordinary life of Zen master Yin Wan and the great achievements of the tradition he pioneered, the Huang Bo Chan tradition in China, also known as the Obaku School of Zen Buddhism in Japan. These events highlight the intersection between religion, art, and culture in China and Japan, Activities include an online exhibition of works of art related to the Obaku tradition at ingen.arizona.edu, academic lectures, musical performances, and tea-related events. The lecture series is made possible thanks to generous support from Wanfu Temple in Fuching, Lingyin Temple in Hangzhou, and matcha.com. For more information about our lecture series, please visit our website at cbs.arizona.edu. So before beginning, first of all, I'm Ray DeShiel and I'm an assistant professor of religious studies and East Asian studies here at the University of Arizona. I'd also like to thank the online host for our event, Dr. Robert Gordon, a fellow of the Center of Buddhist Studies and assistant professor at the Fred Fox School of Music in the College of Fine Arts. He will be our point person for the online attendees of whom there are many. So I'll turn it over to Robert for a moment to say hi and to explain how to ask a question if you're attending on Zoom. And then I will introduce our guest for today's lecture. Thank you, Ray. Uh, welcome everyone online and in person. Um, and we'll, we'll welcome to Professor Dr. Harold Conrad, such an honor to have you. So online here, you know, please just Go ahead and put your um, questions in the chat. I will monitor the, monitor those. And at the end of the um, the session, uh, I think we go back and forth normally between uh, online question and uh, in person question. And I'll be sure to get uh, as many as I can in. So welcome, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right, so Harold Conrad holds a chair of modern Japanese studies at the University of Dusseldorf, Germany. Prior appointments were at the School of Asian Studies at the University of Sheffield, the Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University, and the German Institute for Japanese Studies. Harold's research focuses primarily on Japanese human resource management, social policy, and the structure and practices of traditional markets. As an avid collector of Japanese calligraphy, he has also worked on the Japanese art market and published a seal handbook on the Confucian scholar, Kameda Bosai. In the 2000s, he was the only foreign member of an antique studies group around the late Japanese collector, Apsumi Kuniyasu, and the late art dealer, Kobayashi Katsuhiro in Tokyo. Harold has contributed a number of Obaku pieces from his collection to the ongoing online exhibition about Ingen Ryuki at the University of Arizona Center for Buddhist Studies. Many thanks to Dr. Conrad for joining us here in Arizona. We look forward to the Q&A with the audience at the end of his talk, which is entitled Reflections on the Understanding, Appreciation, and Authentication of Obaku Zen Calligraphy. Welcome, Dr. Conrad. Yes, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, let me first thank you all, uh, in particular Professor Jian Wu for inviting me to give this lecture. It's a great honor and it uh, was also an honor to um, give some or show some of my pieces in the online exhibition. Now, after writing the abstract for today's talk, uh, it, uh, I suddenly realized what a monumental task I have set myself uh, to actually <laughs> bring meaning to this title. Uh, reflections uh, already is a bit of a cop out because it allows sort of uh, possibly not so deep reflections, but I hope I can live up to your expectations and um, yeah, say something meaningful about Obaku Zen calligraphy. Let me show you uh, the type of, oh no, the screen is not working. Okay, uh, which one did you do? Sorry. <laughs> 
Okay, right. Okay, so I've set myself four questions. Um, is it possible for Western audience to understand and appreciate Obaku Zen calligraphy? Uh, then, um, which impact did Obaku Zen calligraphy and script culture have in Japan? Um, since I'm a collector, I'm very much also interested in issues of authenticity. And so what are sort of pertinent questions around this? And then I finish rather with a short note, really, on the issue of why Zen calligraphy, Obaku Zen calligraphy, is uh, not so popular in Japan, in Japan as it is uh, among Western collectors and Chinese collectors. Now, uh, the first question is really the biggest one. And um, now, if you look at the abstract, um, you will have seen that uh, traditionally calligraphy ranks among the highest of the arts in, in East Asia, in Japan, in China. Uh, but when you go to uh, major collections in the West, you will find not many calligraphy fees there. For example, last week I just went to the Metropolitan Museum and there was a very uh, impressive exhibition on Chinese uh, paintings and, and there were some color phones um, related to these paintings, but there were no, as far as I can tell, no calligraphic works uh, on their own. So, so that's perhaps a bit of a reflection of uh, to which degree calligraphy uh, is being um, acknowledged as an art in the West. Um, and, and so I think um, I would like to spend a little bit of time on, on this issue, what is actually calligraphy, what meaning does it have before even talking about Obaku, so give me a break a little bit or give me some time, I will be talking about uh, sort of Eastern perceptions of what calligraphy actually is, and then I will show you later lots of pictures, but for the moment you need to uh, sort of be a bit patient. So what is calligraphy? Um, now, if you look at the uh, Cambridge Dictionary, uh, you will see uh, that it is defined as beautiful writing, often created with a special pen or brush. That's obviously a Western definition. Now, in East Asia, calligraphy has much more, uh, a much deeper meaning than just be beautiful writing. And the term shodo, or way of the brush, uh, basically entails uh, that calligraphy is not just understood as beautiful writing. It's something more deeper. Uh, it has to do with psychological maturation. It has something to do with development of character. Um, and actually, when you look at Chinese and Japanese writers on the subject, then you will, fee, uh, uh, you will see that they often invoke quite a high degree of mysticism on this subject. And so I have quite a lot of quotes that I'm going to show you uh, to basically uh, make this point, uh, what uh, sort of Eastern view on this is. Uh, so I have chosen two sources for this. One is uh, from, from Chen uh, and the other one is from Yi. They are both basically introductions into Chinese calligraphy for Western audience. And I uh, sort of start with citing those quite heavily and then reflect on, uh, uh, you know, on the limitations and, and sort of develop a critical understanding of this. So Chen says the Tao way is mysterious and profound and it is the door to various wonders. So he cites from a different source. Here I apply this dictum to Chinese calligraphy, which I see as mysterious and profound, and it's the door to various kinds of art. So you, here you have this issue, calligraphy is the entry point to other arts, but it's also very mysterious and profound. Copying historical models of calligraphy is regarded as the key to master the forms. If you want to become a famous calligrapher, you have to copy several model books and finally write characters freely and establish your own style. Satisfaction comes from a comparison of your skill today with that of yesterday, rather than a comparison of your skill with that of others. So again, one important point here, it's always referring back to the masters. It's not referring to your contemporaries. It's always the masters that uh, have a big influence on calligraphy and its tradition. Um, also, calligraphy is understood to have physiological and psychological benefits. A deep breath will speed up the circulation of the blood and thus massage your internal organs. As a result, you will feel physiologically well. So that's yet another dimension of calligraphy. Through learning and practicing calligraphy, the calligrapher increases his knowledge and accomplishments. In this way, he may become an erudite, civilized, noble, progressive person. So a lot of positive aspects, uh, attitudes, uh, characteristics that a good calligrapher embodies. Um, 
sorry for my, I, 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 I'm not a Chinese speaker, so forget about my pronunciation. I will just read <laughs> as it says. Uh, Sun Guiting, a calligrapher theorist of the Tang Dynasty, said that he hoped that calligraphers would achieve maturity in both moral character and calligraphic skill. Now, this moral character dimension uh, is really features heavily in writing on calligraphy. It is commonly believed in China that calligraphy expresses the personality of the writer, an individual's character, disposition, and propensities, as well as his good and bad fortune, are said to be accurately ascertainable from his handwriting. I'm aware that the art of interpreting the handwriting of Western countries has become almost a science, but in my opinion, the variety of construction and the arrangement and form of the strokes make Chinese even more susceptible to this form of analysis. Now, now we move on to the next uh, uh, stage, which is uh, what can we tell about the character of the writer through the calligraphy. Following a positive and negative examples, of people's appreciation of calligraphic works according to the moral characters of the calligraphers. Now, uh, here, Yi goes very far, <laughs> I would say, to tell us that from the examples of the emperor Hui Xiong writing, ex executed in style of the peculiar to him and termed slender gold, we can infer that he was a person of handsome appearance tall and slim, meticulously as to detail, with a somewhat effeminate temperament. You can even affirm that he, that he has a slow and measure of speech. Now, I would want, I really wonder whether we can tell all these things by just looking at those characters. I think this is really taking it too much and uh, we can all overdo it. So I warn you, uh, don't take all these things uh, too serious, but of course, some there is some truth in it and I'm not uh, saying that it isn't. Uh, the interesting, and now I'm getting into the politics of calligraphy. The interesting thing is that some people that used to be very famous for their hand, Later, because they fell out of favor, uh, such as uh, Zhang Rui uh, uh, he, he was a Ming official uh, who fell out of favor, and later then his writings were deemed to be uh, showing a bad character, despite the fact that he was actually one of the major masters of the time. So the negative example concerns uh, Zhang Ritui, excuse me again for my Chinese. His calligraphy is powerful and dynamic, especially his big calligraphic works in cursive script. So these are not cursive script examples, but are impressive with free strokes and inking and tremendous momentum. But his character was held in contempt by the people of his time and later, and his calligraphic artistry was overshadowed by his bad character. People detest the calligraphic works of people of bad character because it is very difficult for viewers to separate the work from the calligrapher. So there is this issue, uh, what, uh, how does the work and the person uh, go together and what can we say? So I think these are uh, important aspects to consider, uh, to reflect on when we talk about calligraphy. Now, I take it a step further. I'm a social scientist, so uh, calligraphy is also a system of power. Uh, like all writing systems are systems of power. They embody power relations. It's very political. For example, if you look back historically, the power of magic over the illiterate Chinese oracle bones that were inscribed and then put into fire and then we could read uh, uh, sort of what, what, what the gods wanted. There's the power of ideological control of the state, the Qin emperor basically, well, dictating the standard written characters in the third century BC. And then probably for our topic, most importantly, the power of cultural tradition. Writing handsome characters is immensely important um, to, uh, as a standard of civilization, but also to access posts in the Chinese bureaucracy. And so there's a nice, um, um, cartoon here how the aged father insists on guiding the brush of his middle-aged son who uh, is trying to write how to implement the four modernizations. So calligraphy is political and when we later look at Obaku works we will not always be able to say okay uh, what is political here but we ought to think uh, what could have what could it have meant who wrote for whom 
what in what kind of under what kind of circumstances is something that we need to think about. And then finally, um, I think we need to demystify a little bit Chinese characters. Um, actually, only 4% of Chinese characters have pictographic origins, as you can see here. So the character for tree, for example, um, has somewhat the shape of a tree and so on. But most Chinese characters actually represent sounds and they are not pictographs and they convey information. Uh, they don't convey uh, information by representing objects and concepts directly. Um, so having said this, Chinese calligraphy is not an abstract art. Obviously, it's a writing system, but divorced from specific content, the abstract forms of Chinese characters lend themselves to these generalizations of oriental spirituality, love of nature, or whatever values the viewer brings to the art. So people might see something in the calligraphy, they are reminded of something, but again, I would uh, caution you to be careful. And there's even Eastern writers who somehow uh, conduct some kind of self exotization I would say, even they uh, tend to uh, get into this kind of game. Um, I'm obviously fascinated by Chinese calligraphy. <laughs> so some of that is also happening in me. I'm not neutral, uh, but I, I would generally think we need to be careful uh, what we are doing. And then in the end, if you look at linguistic studies, you will find that yes, Chinese has its own distinctive features, but it works essentially along the same principles as other writing systems. And psycholinguistic experiments show that the brain uh, treats visual and verbal information in Chinese just in, in the same manner as in English, for example. So uh, I want to sort of demystify some of that, which makes it also hopefully easier than to uh, assess uh, Chinese characters. Um, and then uh, also uh, sort of two more cartoons on this topic. Um, now, obviously, as a Chinese uh, reader, Japanese reader, it's impossible to ignore the meaning. Yeah, so just like uh, an art uh, 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 or investment uh, banker will find it very hard to ignore the meaning of, of the art that is being shown here. Uh, and a Chinese speaker might also have illusions uh, to, or Chinese, Japanese speakers might have illusions uh, to other subjects when they see a calligraphy here, for example, we have the character for goose. Uh, but this gentleman here is actually just concentrating on the upper part of that character, which happens to be the character for me, right? So, so all these things go on in those that have knowledge of the script. And, and um, so that is altogether a different approach. Okay, now let's come to the Western eye. The question is, uh, what can we, the Westerners, uh, do uh, observe uh, when it comes to Chinese calligraphy? Um, well, uh, some uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, Yi, for example, says, unfortunately, however, except for those brought up in the artistic traditions of the country, its aesthetic significance seems to be very difficult to grasp. But he says, if the student can understand the literal meaning of the words, so much the better. For an aesthetic appreciation, it's not essential. So uh, we are, to a certain extent, even able to appreciate this calligraphy if we do not uh, necessarily understand the language. But I do feel that without this sense of recognition, it is possible, provided one has a sense of line movement and a knowledge of the frame structure of the matter to appreciate the beauty of lines. So uh, it, we are not told that it's absolutely impossible to understand calligraphy. Now, the untrained Western eye tends to be drawn to brushwork of Chinese characters detached from their meaning. And that might explain why this kind of expressive brushwork, modern brushwork, uh, here in this case by Inoue Yuichi, uh, sort of a uh, post-war famous Japanese calligrapher, is very popular and gaining in popularity in Western audiences. And there were even collaborations between Japanese avant-garde calligraphers and American abstract expressionists. Uh, but then the Japanese realized actually uh, the American abstract expressionists, they don't really understand the meaning of the characters and, and somehow this uh, yeah, uh, didn't go very far, um, this collaboration and the Japanese were somewhat frustrated about this lack of understanding. 
So I said I would talk a lot about calligraphy before even mentioning Obaku. I'll, ca I'll come to Obaku in a minute. No worries. Um, um, now I come to calligraphy um, as an art. Um, and uh, I sort of, I'm, I'm using here a famous Zen quote, the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon, but calligraphy or Zen calligraphy for that matter and ink painting can be appreciated, I think, like other art. How is the space being used? What animates the composition? What kind of forms uh, have been created? Positive, negative space? What kind of brushwork? Thick, thin, rapid, patient? What about the ink? Wet, dry, flat, luminous, graded, consistently deep. So uh, you see here's the collector speaking. The more you look at this, the more uh, sort of you think of, of, of uh, ways to describe it. Now, uh, Steve Addis, um, a famous professor in Japanese art, uh, who was also a musician, he talked of the choreography of line and form in space. I think this is a good way to think about calligraphy, because it is, after all, an art that is developing. Now, let's move on to Zen calligraphy, and we're getting then to Obaku. Uh, I think there are some issues that are quite interesting to um, um, sort of reflect on. Um, obviously, in Zen Buddhism, there is a general distrust in words, but at the same time, we have a large body of scriptures. So how do you bring this together? Um, does a Zen monk who has gone beyond the limiting concepts of a self nonetheless show his personality in his brushwork? What is it? Or are we seeing actually something else? Is it an expression of something that is beyond the self? Does the produ production of the calligraphy just take a minute when it is written? Or does it indeed actually take a lifetime and embodies all the experience of the calligrapher. So these are just some questions that I will not be able to tie <laughs> exactly to particular works, but I think there are quite interesting questions to look at when you look at calligraphy. Okay, so I said uh, I would talk about Obaku, and now I start off uh, with looking at pieces by Ingen, uh, whose uh, anniversary we are obviously here uh, celebrating, and um, I have chosen a number of works. Uh, from the age of 64 to his deathbed, aged 82. Now, uh, Ingen um, wrote uh, uh, a lot of uh, calligraphy. There's literally thousands of, of works still in existence. Um, and uh, one thing that we can see from this, if we move from sort of from the upper left to the lower right, is how his style has developed over time. So it used to be quite loose, uh, more spacious, um, uh, and then later over time, the characters get more uh, dense and, and each character uh, sort, of, uh, sort of has more sort of a, a box. Um, and uh, then we get to his death poem, uh, which is one genre of uh, Zen calligraphy. So death poems are uh, particularly um, uh, important in the Zen tradition. Um, they are mostly owned by, by the uh, monasteries. Uh, where these masters die, they are not really available or in museums collections or so. And so we see here that um, Ingen wrote his uh, final verse essentially with his own hand, but he lost somehow control uh, already, uh, even though we can still see sort of very typical features of his style. Um, above that, um, we see a, a, a Geju. Uh, Geju are sort of uh, poems on Zen topics. Um, so this is again one genre of, of uh, calligraphy. Um, but we also have, not here, but we also have, let's say, po poems that not necessarily have a Zen Buddhistic uh, meaning. Or we have here, this is from my collection in the lower left here, instructional poems, uh, Shindogo, um, which is uh, something that is presumably here, in this case, written for a lay practitioner, uh, for the Zen person, uh, Chikuzen. Uh, here on the, well, I, I can't really move. <laughs> I move out of picture. Uh, so the, the, uh, the left side, um, to the left of the seals, you can see that this is, uh, the writing of this is uh, uh, for, for this particular person. 
So this is a sort of a first impression of uh, Obaku calligraphy. Now I want to go back a little bit and just uh, sort of establish where Obaku calligraphy entered into what kind of uh, landscape Obaku calligraphy entered. Um, now, um, again, I'm going back quite a bit. I will keep it very short. Chinese script and calligraphy was introduced in Japan in the fifth to sixth century. And then it has developed essentially in two major traditions. Uh, one tradition is called Kalayo, the Chinese style. Um, and that has obviously always been heavily influenced by respective Chinese developments and broadly defined, obviously it's not very easy to do this, but I think art historians would agree on that. We have three waves of influence, significant influence, uh, until the 17th century. And Obaku is the third wave. Yeah. I'll show those two other waves as well. And then we have the Japanese tradition, the Bayo style, which is the unique Japanese writing style, which includes uh, the development of hiragana, katakana, syllable uh, um, uh, characters. I won't mention those at all. So I'm looking only at Karayo henceforth. And um, so the first wave, uh, is actually going back to Tang, China, uh, where we have frequent Japanese embassies that brought the then current, then um, admired Chinese styles to Japan, including rubbings uh, by, by Wang Ji uh, sort of the, the, the god, so to speak, of, of Chinese calligraphy. Everybody will know. Um, and um, we find, for example, his rubbings being uh, donated to Todaiji um, uh, in, uh, during this time. And priest Kukai, a Japanese priest of the time, um, shown on the upper right, exemplifies really this high uh, Tang style. So uh, this is very close to the Tang dynasty Chinese calligraphy style. Uh, with the fall of the Tang, then uh, contact between Japan and China ceased, and the Japanese developed their own Wayo style. Um, and sort of an early uh, expression of this here you see, Ono no Mikikase, which is 928. So you see sort of the development of more rounder forms. But as I said, I won't be focusing on Wayo from now on. Now, the second wave is interesting because now we have the Zen calligraphy, the Zen monks having a major impact. So during the Kamakura period, uh, calligraphy of then Sung China was brought back principally by famous Japanese monks and emigre Chinese monks. And we see the rise of the Rinzai school of Zen. And uh, popular in this school was a less technical, often rugged style, and uh, which was well representative of, of Zen attitudes of the of the time. Um, and uh, so here are just two examples uh, on the right, Musu Soseki, and on the left, uh, Daito Kokshi, um, uh, just to show, to give you a feeling what this style looks like. It's not so rounded, it is a bit rough on the edges, it's not as technical. And this um, actually goes on, so this is a bit more on the second wave. We could say uh, that the second wave lasts well into the 18th century. Uh, and especially in the 15th century, then uh, Zen calligraphy becomes an important part of tea ceremony. And, um, and in this tea ceremony um, 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 system, this bold, dry, often dry brushboard with scratchy appearance is very typical and, and very much appreciated. You know? um, admittedly, I have chosen samples that fit this argument. Uh, they I could also probably find uh, examples that do not exactly fit this, uh, but I, well, uh, I, I'm stating it here. It, it's not that easy to make this kind of uh, storyline, but I think uh, most uh, art historians would probably agree uh, with me on this characterization. And then we have the third wave, as I said, and the third wave is Obaku Zen, which then sets off a new development of Kalayu, of Chinese style calligraphy in Japan. Now, uh, Ingen arrives in 1654 after the country, sort of closed country policy of 1635. And that marks broadly the beginning of this 
new wave. Actually, some Japanese scholars, when they talk about Kalayo, they will actually think only of this period and not necessarily the period before. But that depends a bit on the writer. Now, what is typical of this style? It's a broad, curve linear, well, you could say graceful style. All these words are really difficult to choose. How do we, how do we uh, characterize this? Now, this fell on a very fruitful um, ground because uh, we had already Neo-Confucianism being uh, propagated by the Tokugawa uh, government. And so there was already an interest in the latest Chinese developments in Japan. Um, and this calligraphy of Obaku monks uh, was seen as a unique combination of, on, on the one hand, dynamism and, and calmness, you know, and found a lot of uh, admirers in Japan, not so much among the Zen community, as I will show in a minute, uh, but very much among scholars and uh, literati um, and uh, artists. Um, and so Edis, um, describes, for example, Ingen's personal style as a combination of dignity and spontaneity in which the inner balance of his own character is revealed. So you can see Addis also uses this language. I'm not saying he's wrong. Of course, I believe that this expresses something of this nature. Otherwise, I wouldn't be drawn to that calligraphy, probably. So these are two pieces from for my collection here. I will go back to the cypress tree in the courtyard, which, which is a Zen koan, um, which uh, Ingen wrote um, um, very late in his, in his life, uh, but also one of his um, um, disciples, Nangen Shoha, um, uh, basically shows this particular style. Now, Intriguingly, obaku culture had a strong influence on Japanese professional artists and literati, as I said already, but less so on the native tradition of Zen painting and calligraphy. And I think there are two reasons for this. One is probably political, uh, because the syncretic obaku teachings were not recognized uh, by all Japanese leaders of the Rinzai establishment. So the politics of calligraphy, so to speak, might have played a role. And then also artistically, we have already at the time very well established links between monks of the Daitokuji uh, lineage, the Rinzai Zen uh, lineage, and practitioners of Chanuyu. And they continued to favor this rugged dry brushwork. Um, and so therefore the Obaku um, writers couldn't really get into this. So therefore Obaku calligraphy was predominantly integrated into the new uh, newly developing Sencha tea ceremony, and it influenced Confucian scholars and literati. And I will show uh, later some examples of this. Um, here, just a sort of one uh, thing. Uh, this is Mokuan Shoto, uh, so the second abbot of Mampukuji, uh, a one-liner calligraphy in a typical Sencha uh, tea ceremony setting. So this is uh, where Obak calligraphy obviously plays a major role up to this day. Now, Ingen and his 20 followers were not only men of considerable philosophical and artistic capabilities, they obviously also represented the latest culture of Ming Dynasty China, and the Japanese were very keen to learn about this. Now, Ingen brought with him many books of rubbings of the ancients. Yeah? So again, Ingen also in this Chinese tradition, copying the masters, what I talked earlier, but he also had among his possessions, many examples of recent calligraphy from Ming Dynasty masters. And so, for example, there is a, a two-volume uh, issue of Bokuri, which is an important calligraphy journal, um, no longer uh, being published, but, but, but is quite important in Japan. And they have actually two issues that focus on this, um, on the possession of these um, Chinese Ming Dynasty masters. Actually, many of those are no longer considered to be authentic, uh, so they were already carrying fakes over. But um, anyway, uh, it's important that they did. Um, and as I said, there was a large Japanese demand for specimens of Indians and other Obakuman calligraphy. Now, I haven't seen any uh, primary sources that talk about what was going on at the time, but I uh, read something uh, about 
Korean embassies that were also visiting Japan at the times and the Korean ambassadors, they were complaining about constantly being pestered by Japanese scholars who wanted to see their writings and want to get examples of that. So I perhaps something of, of that sort was called also going on uh, with Obaku monks, I don't know. Perhaps there's records, uh, I haven't uh, seen them. Now, now I want to look at sort of four fields in which Obaku calligraphic culture had a major impact in Japan. I would like to look at signboards, seals, print culture, and Japanese calligraphers. So people that were directly impacted by Obaku calligraphy. Now, temple play, plaques, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I hope I pronounce this correctly. Um, they were already existent in Japan, but Addis notes that wooden signboards, uh, while not new in Japan, became actually very, very prominently used in Obaku temples. And the layout there is also a very Chinese layout. So we have a horizontal plaque at the top and then pairs of vertical ones along the pillars. So the mountain gate, the Sammon of Mampokuji is a typical example that. Um, now, temple plagues are a fascinating uh, subject because they also show a little bit about the interactions of Obaku uh, monks with other uh, uh, members of Japanese society and, well, uh, what a higher member of Japanese society could be uh, but Emperor Umizuno, with whom, uh, who was deeply impressed by Ingen and be actually became a follower of Ingen. So Gumizono Tenno uh, had built a, a temple in the north of Kyoto, uh, which is the Entsuji. Uh, I can highly recommend Entsuji also as a touristic destination. Uh, it's very famous for its borrowed scenery garden. So you have Mount here in the back and the, the mountain is essentially integrated into the uh, garden view. Now, Entsuji, Ensu also reading as all penetrating is another name for the God of compassion, Kanon. Now Kanon worship was, that's my understanding anyway, unusual in other Zen schools, but Obaku was also syncretic in other uh, in, in relationships, combined Zen and the cult of Kanon. So I think from that, uh, we can learn a lot about uh, yeah, the interactions of Obaku with uh, Japanese society. Now, the, the second sample I have chosen is um, actually the, uh, the first principle. This is the signboard that is among the, so, uh, the uh, front gate, uh, Somon of uh, Mampukuji, written by Kosen Shoton, uh, which is the, who is the fifth abbot of uh, Mampukuji. Um, I come to the meaning in a minute. Um, Kerr, Alex Kerr, uh, sort of relates in, in his book about Kyoto uh, a story that the senior monk Daizu allegedly criticized Kosen's trials to write those characters and that he had to do it 80 times before finally they arrived at a perfect uh, example. Now, what does this mean, Daichigi, the first principle? Um, Kerr, uh, in his sort of discussion uh, brings up this um, um, saying of don't rely on words, fulio moji, uh, as something uh, that uh, relates to this. And I believe that th this is actually what this scroll, uh, what this inscription is all about. And uh, sort of to show you uh, that this is also found in other contexts, I have chosen another work for my um, collection, which is uh, by Kamida Bosai, who is a Confucian scholar, about whom I've also published this, this uh, book that was earlier mentioned. And he writes, the first principle is beyond words. So I believe that this is really what this calligraphy at the entrance to Mambuguji is all about. The first principle uh, cannot be yeah, understood through words, it's beyond words. So this is a, a very powerful example of uh, Obaku calligraphy again. Um, then another very important um, and interesting uh, writing is by uh, Heen, the master of Ingen. He never visited Japan, um, but he was Ingen's master. And uh, this writing, uh, if you look at the writing itself uh, and you have some experience, you will note that it's very strange. There's something strange about it. 
And uh, the fact is that he actually wrote with his left hand. He didn't write with his right hand. Um, apparently, there aren't any records, really. Uh, or I'm not so quite sure anymore what, what to believe uh, on uh, whether or not um, he uh, actually had his hand chopped off by bandits during the turbulent Ming uh, Qing transition. But that is what, what we have told. Um, and uh, now let's talk about the meaning. The meaning is actually, uh, again, a Zen koan. Um, so Rinzai, the founder of Rinzai School of Zen, was asked by his disciple um, on his deathbed, um, so what are your last words? And he said, you are all useless, just a bunch of blind moods. So this is something that was put up in the founder's hall in, in Mampuguji, so uh, the most important building in a way uh, in Mampuguji. And obviously, um, yeah, it's, it's referring in, is referring back to Heen as the master of Ingen, who is the uh, founder of Mampukuji. Um, just a note on, on Heen, a little bit more on Heen. Uh, here you see a portrait of Heen on the right, and you can see that his right hand is not visible. Now, this is not a pictorial convention in, in these kind of portraits. Normally, you see these monks with two hands, so that lends some credibility to the fact that he lost his right hand. In any case, I think we can be very sure that he wrote with his left. Now on the left-hand side is a work uh, in my collection by Heen, um, and uh, it reads, the meaning of Bodhidharma's coming from the West can only be looked at after Kalpa's returning. So Kalpa is a very long time, unmeasurable long time, millions of years. And Professor GM Yu, uh, who, with whom I had been in touch, uh, about this several years ago, uh, suggested that it actually could have something to do with Heen's psychological state uh, when he wrote this. So he wrote this in 1656, and uh, in 1654, his book, uh, Wu Deng Yantong, was uh, forbidden, um, censored, uh, in which he had advocated strict criteria for Dharma transmission. So for the real Dharma transmission to uh, work again, it will take millions of years. So he might allude here to his personal experience uh, and the problems about establishing the true authenticity in the transmission of the Dharma. And um, also, again, the political aspect here, he in his writings would have functions as credentials for Ingen at the time, uh, because Ingen was still in detention um, at Fumonji, um, sort of under suspicion from the Tokugawa. And so we can, well, we can certain that Ingen was possibly able to yeah, lend credibility to his efforts by having uh, calligraphy from him. And there are actually a number of works dated the same year, which I found very interesting. If you look at the not many authentic works by he and many are dated uh, to the spring of 1656. Okay, um, now I come to another example of uh, a signboard. Um, and this uh, is interesting because um, Zen temples um, follow, I think since the 15th century, this became sort of the standard, a 70 pole temple structure. So a Zen temple has to have seven main buildings, mountain gate, Buddha hall, Dharma hall, meditation hall, bathhouse, and latrine. And these are laid out sort of in an anthropomorphic layout, as you can see here uh, on the uh, left. So the foot is essentially the bathhouse. And so uh, many years, no, not, not so many years ago, I found this calligraphy in, in Japan. Um, bathhouse. No Japanese collector would have bought this. Uh, this cannot be used in any ceremony or what, whatsoever. Uh, most people will find this rather strange, but I was just really found this absolutely powerful calligraph calligraphic work. It's very big. It's 40 centimeters times 86.5 centimeters. So it has the size to be hung up high on a bathhouse window, uh, bathhouse uh, ceiling. Uh, and then later when I did some research, I learned that this is actually the template for uh, a signboard that still exists uh, in Zuluji uh, in Takaoka, uh, modern Toyama prefecture. And on the bottom right here, you can see the actual 
signboard that was then carved using this template. But that seems to be the original template. So obviously I was very pleased to learn this, even though most people will probably still find it strange that I bought this. Mm -hmm. um, and then I come to another plaque, which, uh, which also uh, shows something about Obaku calligraphy, which is um, this sort of typical combination of red, black, and gold. Um, and uh, so it's a very Chinese uh, uh, signboard. Uh, this is uh, um, by Mushin Shokaku, one of the followers of, of Ingen, and uh, it summarizes essentially two koans, um, has been translated here by Bill Porter. Um, I just want to sort of, uh, don't want to go into too much into the meaning here, just the layout is a very typical layout for Obaku calligraphy. So we have an enlarged character followed by a script. Sometimes the large character is part of, uh, let's say in this uh, case here, a, a seven character two line poem so, or, or yeah, text, but sometimes it's sort of detached from this and you have then uh, let's say a seven character um, two line uh, text after this. Now I move on to the next impact, which is seals. Um, seals are uh, important in calligraphy, have always been in Japan as well. But until the arrival of Obaku Zen, seals were usually carved from wood, sometimes also from stone, but seal carving was not yet considered to be a true art form. And that happened with the arrival of Obaku. Um, and the, the good thing about stone, it has this allows this combination of precision and creativity at the same time, which appealed greatly to the Japanese literati and therefore uh, really influenced the development of seal carving in Japan. Obaku seals are generally square, rectangular, or oval, um, and they are arranged with very great compositional skill and care. Um, here I've chosen uh, sort of five examples, all showing the same uh, text, which is Rinzai Shoshu, the true sect of Rinzai. So the expression that Obaku uh, Ingen and his followers considered themselves to be the true followers uh, in the Rinzai tradition. And you can see how, yeah, uh, basically uh, unlimited forms of combinations are possible and, and just sealed study is, is an art in itself and um, yeah, fascinating. Um, I'll later come to issues of the authenticity. Uh, these seals obviously can also be used to see whether an artwork is actually um, authentic or not. First, we need to look at the script, but we also need to look at the seals. Um, here I have more seals, uh, just to give you an impression, I cannot go into all the nitty gritty of these seals. Uh, again, ma major Japanese monks, Ingen, Mokuan, Kosen, Doktan, Etsuzan, uh, so all very beautiful carved, uh, rather large in, in size compared to what is usually used uh, in, in other sc schools, uh, Zen schools, or also Confucian calligraphy in Japan. Uh, then I think one aspect of Obaku culture uh, that has been neglected and is still understudied is print culture. Um, there is a little bit of literature on this, but um, Chinese craftsmen that who accompanied um, uh, Ingen uh, were not also were not only uh, very capable in temple building and sculpture, but they actually also were very skilled in printing. And so we have very fine embossed decorated papers that they brought with them and also produced currently in Japan. For example, here on the right, I don't know whether you can see this, this is a sort of very nice, very uh, light embossed paper. Um, and so allegedly uh, this kind of paper and, and the printing uh, of these uh, wood blocks uh, had a significant influence of, on the development of the early ukiyo-e. Um, so we'll be talking late 17th century, so none of this had, had yet been established what later then becomes the, the, the ukiyo-e uh, world. Um, but as I said, I don't think the uh, connections there are very clear. I have here chosen again an example for my collection, which is uh, a poem by, by Nangen Shoha, and you can see again very fine blue uh, uh, woodblock print of very delicate lines here uh, that set this piece uh, up. 
Another aspect of print culture is the printing of the uh, complete Buddhist canon by, uh, well, Tetsugen Doko. I'll talk uh, about him a, a bit more in a minute. So he was a Japanese uh, follower of Mokuan, is a Dharma of Mokuan, and he was, he established, uh, or no, he um, was able to, well, accomplish this major task of printing the complete canon uh, with, yeah, 7,000 volumes and 60,000 individual wood blocks. So you can see here, uh, this is a picture now being taken uh, within the compounds of Mampukuji. And uh, so they're storing all these wood blocks there still and still take uh, prints from them. Um, now, Do, uh, Tetsugen uh, is arguably the best known uh, Obakuman of Japanese origin. Um, he was first a, a true pure land sect uh, follower, but he was then dissatisfied with the sect's approval of meat eating and marriage, and then he converted and moved to Ingen and later uh, Mokuan. Um, and so he achieved uh, essentially this. Now, uh, now I want to uh, sort of, uh, I've done sort of a bit of an artistic experiment here. I, I watched the Mondrian exhibition uh, a few months ago, and so I thought, okay, let's do this with some colors, Mondrian colors. Uh, so what? Um, why is this beautiful? <laughs> uh, what is going on here? So I think uh, we can capture the round forms with the yellow circle. Uh, we can also see that uh, there is a very, um, um, regular sort of uh, parallel um, rhythm, if you want, um, of these strokes. And the blue strokes show sort of strokes that we don't see, something that happens in the air, which is the connection from one character to the next. So, and then if you abstract this, you almost have an abstract word, uh, word of art. <laughs> um, now, major figures of Calligraphy. I won't be going into much detail here. These are just some names. Uh, we have the three brushes of Obaku, Obaku Sampitsu, uh, something which is very popular in Japan that people get lumped together as major um, sort of um, uh, impacts. Uh, and so the Obaku Sampitsu are Ingen, Mokuan, and Sokuhi. And then we have Dokuryu Shoeki, who is sort of an outlier, if you want, because he became uh, an Obaku monk only later. He immigrated already before Ingen to Japan. Uh, he was a physician and very accomplished calligrapher. And actually, nowadays, his calligraphy is probably uh, valued uh, highest uh, in this Obaku uh, canon. And then we have, we have Kosen and Etsuzan. So I'm trying to show you here, I, I realize this is perhaps not easy to, to see, <laughs> uh, but this is uh, the established line of, uh, of, of uh, in influence, if you want. So we have, uh, for example, Dokuryu Shoeki on the left. So these are two uh, parts of, of a very long hand scroll, which is also on the Indian website now from, from my collection. So uh, he wrote a very accomplished social grass script style and uh, in a clerical script style on the lower left. And then he influenced, for example, Fukami Gentai, uh, who was a Nagasaki-based uh, calligrapher, and also Kitajima Setsuzan, which is a Japanese, uh, well, scholar calligrapher, and who in turn then influenced Hosa, Hoso, uh, excuse me, Hosoi Kotaku. So this is something which, again, you might not see immediately when you look at it, but this is essentially how Japanese scholars have established these lines of impact. Um, another example uh, would be uh, how Sokuhi's calligraphy here on the left, which is very fluid again, and each character is written essentially with, uh, with one line. The, the, the paper never leaves the never leaves, uh, the, the brush never leaves the paper, um, has influenced, I think, uh, we can see to some extent, Hayashi Doe. Uh, Hayashi Doe was a Japanese-Chinese interpreter uh, in Nagasaki again, um, and so is also now uh, considered a very um, high quality in Japan. And then uh, I think more, um, how should I say, a, a more standard uh, calligraphy that has probably had the, the widest impact in Japan uh, is 
shown by, by Essan or Etsuzan, um, who uh, actually his role was later um, as a sort of cultural intermediary between China and Japan, was highlighted many years after his, his death by Tanumura Chikuden, a Japanese, a famous Japanese painter in his Mountain Dwellers chatter. Uh, and, and so Chikuden stressed the importance of these emigre Chinese monks in the transmission of Chinese literati, arts, and ideals. And I've just chosen uh, one example, which is by uh, Lai Sanyo, again, a major Japanese um, historian and calligrapher. Um, and again, yeah, you might or might not see the impact here, but that is uh, definitely something that uh, uh, scholars of calligraphy would um, acknowledge. Um, I want to sort of looking at the time. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm good at the time. Uh, I want to look a little bit more at individual works. Um, first, uh, a work by Dok Tan, uh, who was the fourth abbot of Mampukuji. And that is apparently a very rare piece. I was told by um, Tanaka Sensei in the uh, uh, Mampukuji, it's a gata about the releasing of animals, uh, so animals that were, were destined to be slaughtered. So I'm not knowledgeable enough whether there were actually ceremonies like this, that whether there was a practice in Obaku to release animals. So I don't know, that would be an interesting question if people know anything about this. So this is a text um, all beings are of the same essence. Mutual damage is regrettable. To show mercy once, that's how you achieve awakening. So that's basically what you ought to do. Now, I want to look at another way to appreciate calligraphy by doing this. Uh, what, what's the meaning of this? The meaning of this is to uh, look at two, two aspects. Uh, one is where does the ink run out? Um, the ink... Uh, does not necessarily run out, but the artist might decide that it should run out. So this is also uh, an artistic uh, choice to some extent. So the red uh, lines here show uh, the rhythm of the ring running out and the new ink being uh, used. The blue lines show uh, uh, where the seven, so this is a seven character quadrain. And so in the first line, um, he follows this seven character rhythm, but then uh, further on, uh, the, the next line actually doesn't show seven characters, it shows six characters and then one final character in the third line. And so this is basically showing that this, uh, the, the structure of the poem is not necessarily followed when something is being put on paper. So we, in a way, there's two more rhythms <laughs> apart from the rhythm of the writing going on. So it becomes a monthly dimensional um, work. I mean, I'm not always looking at calligraphy, thinking all these things in my head, but these are all aspects, I think, which are uh, something we should consider when we look at calligraphy and also over calligraphy for that matter. Um, here, two more very interesting uh, examples for my collection. Uh, the left one um, is uh, it just says a sash of clouds. Now the the, the, the the sash character is elongated, extremely elongated, and then the last character there is only read readable by people who know uh, grass script. Otherwise, people would just not know that this is uh, the character for clouds. Uh, but now, going back to what I introduced in the beginning, um, are we interpreting here too much into this, uh, that we have this kind of lofty uh, feeling? Uh, I guess here, in this case, uh, we could probably follow uh, this interpretation. On the right-hand side, we have, again, a very playful um, uh, calligraphy. I mean, the translation of this, I realize, is, is not an easy one. Uh, it's just a suggestion. It, it's definitely something that uh, invokes sort of uh, positive meanings. Uh, it's not, I think, a very uh, Zenish uh, uh, writing. Uh, it's kind of the five uh, uh, five rice uh, mochi that have been on a stick. So I think it's quite a playful piece um, that that is anyway uh, the illusions uh, that uh, uh, that I have when I look at this piece. Um, here again, I've done a bit of uh, playing around with with these rhythms, uh, sort of accentuating uh, here on the right uh, the last character 
um, uh, and showing, okay, this is all the kind of qualities that we can look at. Now, let me uh, to come to my last topic, authenticity, very shortly. Copying the masters, including their signatures, is absolutely accepted historical practice in China, in Japan. Even the Chinese emperors had artworks copied into minute detail. And so copies of Obaku calligraphy might not always have been made with the intention to deceive, but I, as a collector, as a Westerner, I cannot jump over my shadow. I want the real thing. <laughs> so I'm quite obsessed with this. And, and I've also made many mistakes. Uh, and I think making mistakes is part of that journey. So um, establishing authenticity is important uh, because there is a lot of problematic pieces out there and many of them have been published. Um, so I've just two examples. Uh, there is a, a catalog, a very nice catalog uh, by Moss. Uh, it contains 49 pieces, not all of them Obaku. In my eyes, at least 16 of them are doubtful. Uh, there's a China, but this is not just a, a Western phenomenon. By no means, there's actually lots of fakes being bought uh, in China and published. Um, so this is a, a catalog from 2012, 72 Obaku pieces, at least 22, I would say, are very uh, doubtful. Um, what can we say about these Obaku pieces that are doubtful? Um, they are far more common, I think, than people uh, are aware of. Uh, they are not restricted to the famous free brushes, Inge and Moku and Sokuhi, that even other less known people are affected. They are usually not modern forgeries, they are old, so you cannot go by, by appearance really. Um, they sometimes come with gorgeous looking mountings, yeah? so very convincing, but you really need to be careful. They are not infrequently found in Western Chinese and Japanese public collections. Um, and unfortunately, many of them have been published. And so if you refer to um, sort of doubtful pieces, then the thing becomes really difficult. So you need to establish what is um, real and what isn't. And to give you one, uh, I, I said I would come back to this scroll of mine. So on the left is my scroll, which is genuine. I'm fairly confident it is. Um, and this is actually, again, a famous koan, um, um, which, uh, um, yeah, here, in response to the question by his pupil, what is the meaning of the founder of Zen Bodhidharma coming from the West? Joshu said, the cypress tree in the courtyard. So, again, I'm not here to explain what that means, but it is obviously a very famous koan and not a bad, not at all bad rendering of this very same I, I saw in 2001, not too long ago, on a, a Yahoo internet auction in Japan. Uh, this is definitely fake. Um, the writing is fake, but also the, the seals are fake. Um, but there's lots of Ingen also in public collections. Here we have uh, on the right-hand side, the Tokyo um, National Museum uh, having an Ingen fake. Uh, we have a very well respected dealer from whom I have bought a lot of pieces and, and I have no problem with him being wrong about this. That is just what happens once in a while uh, in the middle and then on the left hand side, Waseda University Museum, all these pieces are definitely wrong. Uh, what is wrong with them? Uh, very overly round, fluid, repetitive features. So in the middle of the piece, for example, uh, you can see these uh, Mizuhen, the, the, the water character at the left. A, an accomplished calligrapher would not write this three times in this kind of standardized manner. That is just too boring and, and it's not good calligraphy. Also, uh, uneven width, of strokes and awkward spaces between or within characters. I've tried to sort of show this. I am not sure whether you can see this. I think for that, you need really need to look at a lot of uh, calligraphy. And then sometimes densely packed characters with long individual strokes disappearing. I think the upper left is a good example. So you really don't really see anymore what is going on there, what is actually being written there. So this is uh, um, fairly common. Um, so there's lots of out there. Um, obviously, we can go down to the seals. I said earlier, the seals are uh, often giving it away. So I have chosen um, uh, samples from my uh, collection. Uh, the, the red ones are the good ones, and, and the, the gray ones are the 
copies of the seals uh, from this one uh, Waseda scroll here, Waseda University scroll, and I think it becomes fairly obvious that they are different, even though uh, sometimes they are very accomplished. So you really need to look very closely um, at what uh, you know is wrong with these seals. Now, one again very fascinating aspect, and here we go back to this print culture again. So. Um, when I, before I bought this scroll on the left, I was seeing all these heen and I was really worried. I definitely don't want to buy a bad heen, uh, but uh, what is a good one? And so I came along uh, this scroll on the right, which is owned by a, a famous Japanese uh, art dealer in Osaka. Uh, and this scroll is interestingly accompanied with an authentication letter uh, written by Itsunen Shoyu, so the, who is the, the person who actually invited Ingen to come over from China. So this in the middle there is an, a letter which uh, essentially uh, inscribes the, uh, the characters of the scroll uh, on the right, and then it uses little seals that are partly applied to the scroll, to the calligraphy scroll, and to this uh, document. So that is essentially to show, okay, this is one and the same, and this paper belongs to this scroll. And again, you can see this very tiny sort of uh, flowery uh, piece there. This is again, a good example of Obaku print culture, um, which I uh, showed earlier. So after then being sure that the seals on the right scroll are good seals, and having compared those with lots of other seals in the literature, I was then sufficiently happy that the one on the left is also okay. So that's uh, how one can go about this. Um, okay, I'm looking at the time. I think I jump over this. Um, just to show a final wrap up, um, there's not just the, the top people, the top Obaku uh, people, but there's also many others, uh, just an example of fakes, uh, what I deem to be fakes here by Kosen, and then also Etsuzan. So there is no shortage of fakes. The final, very final uh, point I want to make, why is uh, calligraphy, Obaku calligraphy not being, uh, well, very popular in Japan. Now, I would say, again, we need to go back to calligraphy as a system of power. People are uh, taught um, not necessarily in the best way to appreciate and like calligraphy because they have to do it at school. So these are just some examples of uh, how you need to sit, uh, how much space there is supposed to be between you and the table and all that. All very important. I don't, I don't want to downplay this, but many people have this rather negative experience and therefore find it difficult to appreciate uh, calligraphy. And I think this poster here from a very recent exhibition uh, in 2022 in the Nese Museum uh, really talk, sort of manifests this. Many Japanese, modern Japanese, cannot read these things and therefore don't know how to enjoy them. And therefore the title was can't read it but like it so the museum thought that that's a good title to sort of to to uh, establish my last slide um i think uh, another important aspect is that obaku calligraphy is still not part of well has never been part and will never probably be part of chanu yu uh, the tea japanese style tea ceremony and is aesthetics therefore it just doesn't fit the bill it is can only be used uh, in in sencha if you want um, Western, in Japanese uh, probably uh, connoisseurs look, also look at it differently. They are not uh, drawn to this elegant uh, touch of it. Western collectors, on the other hand, have been drawn to these elegant, curved linear, graceful styles. And now, 10 to 15 years ago, we see a very large interest in the Chinese uh, community. Uh, and now the market has sort of somewhat dried up and, and really good quality pieces have become rather rare. So I, I hope I haven't stretched your patience too much uh, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.